so much lost in that void, but I'd give it all for one. Finally, a little time to unwind. I told you things would calm down eventually, didn't I? <laughs> mm hmm. I'm just glad Vincula was so pleased with Cassius's efforts they decided to give us something approximating a weekend. My feet are finally starting to not ache so bad after a trip out, but I'm grateful for the break all the same. <gasps> oh! And Vincula has finally cleared the document we pulled from Specimen 1 for the archival lab. Not a lot to do around here, so I'll be starting my copying and researching while we recuperate. I'm eager to find out if that sad little pile of sheets has more of the unknown language isolate on it. We don't have the results back from carbon dating yet, and Miss Vo was almost too pleased with the sample Cassius retrieved to remind me, once again, to be utterly careful with the book. Almost. I already confirmed the symbols on the sarcophagus I photographed are closely related to those in the Akkadian dual-language original book. Obviously, there are differences in the script, and the medium is unlike the book as well. Stone-chiseled letters look quite different after untold centuries, maybe millennia eroding away, especially as compared to a well-kept book that is only a thousand years old or so. But I think the sarcophagus script is an older form of the same language isolate as the one I'm still trying to fully crack. Unfortunately, I don't have a handy set of Akkadian to go alongside. And at first glance, a lot of the symbols used on the tomb are new to me. Given the circumstances, I'd wager the tomb script carries one of two things. Something negative, like a description of crimes leading to the ritual burial of Specimen 1 or perhaps even a warning not to open the lid at any cost, for fear of unleashing unspeakable evil on the world. Yes, you know I've given a lot of thought to what on earth could have happened to Specimen 1. Even amongst the strange creatures of Gaia, Specimen 1 is still somehow a standout in my mind, in its unnerving behavior and physiology. I still can't unsee the mental image of a skull on what we thought was the head area of that thing. Cassius agreed with me, though. Definitely not a skull and definitely not human. Hmm. Best not to dwell on it, eh, Vox? The other thing that could be on the rim of the tomb is the proper name of the occupant, and things like where they lived, what titles they held, what deeds were done in their name. The more proper nouns used, the harder it is for me to get any translation done. I have no vocal representation of the language, no other examples of writing save the two books now in Vincula's possession, and no known culture from which to derive clues from. Just my own repertoire of linguistic tools and what I can pull from the Akkadian text. Something else has been bothering me about that box. Vincula claimed early on they were complying with authorities and protocols on encountering a new, potentially sentient species. I'm sure these were designed with spacefaring entities in mind, but instead we have a funny little tube that takes us back and forth with relative ease. And while we've yet to encounter the rest of Specimen 1's people, if indeed any exist and there's not a batch of humans on Gaia going around burying things in these ziggurats as a hobby, I can't help but notice how lackluster and unexcited the overall response has felt, I guess. The most scrutiny I've noticed was what I presumed to be a few federal agents in sharp black ties heading to and from Miss Vo's office and the Vincula meeting rooms. As far as I know, no one on the breach team has been directly addressed by any of them. Miss Vo says the recordings we're making are enough for them to analyze, and that we should just keep being rigorous in our field notes. I have trouble believing the federal government is happy to pour over accounts of our journey secondhand. What's more, again, to my knowledge, we are the only ones entering the breach and Gaia itself on a regular basis. 
I'm sure there could be covert missions, but they would most likely be happening during darkness hours on Gaia, which is supposed to be a fatal thing to do. So, aside from Greg's security detail attached to the breachers, it's just us going to and fro. I've even sent requests to Miss Vo to get assistance in translating the language isolate. She just assures me I will have access to other research and researchers once it's been cleared. But there's no way I am the most qualified to be the first contact translator. Sure, I take pride in my work and have credentials for this, but why just me for now? And why is it taking so long to get any help? Sorry, sorry. I'm spending too much time wringing my hands and not petting the baby. Alex told me again I was just worrying too much. It's not like the president was going to come strolling in as if to add a kind of weight to all the proceedings. And the lack of traffic around Vincula must be preferred over being swamped by the press or by masses of people trying to get souvenirs from Gaia. A few agency men taking meticulous notes is definitely more the government style anyway. It's just... I feel inadequate to the task on my own. And I'm still very suspicious of Vincula. I let it cloud my perception of events sometimes. Now that I take a moment here just to kind of breathe and take it all in, it all feels so breathtaking in its scale once more. Translating the bulk of a language can be the work of a lifetime, and I should be feeling things like gratitude for the opportunity, or maybe like a creative frustration. Something like an artist feels before making a masterpiece. Instead, I'm simply overwhelmingly nervous, full of dread and anxiety for what each new revelation in Gaia will bring, lacking all faith in Vincula and maybe even the government to do what's right, culturally, scientifically, morally, in regard to this discovery. Hell, I'm not even sure we can be trusted, whether by incompetence or simple well-meaning mistakes. To say nothing of my life potentially being cut tragically short any day now. <sighs> yes, I know. Your father is being melodramatic again. I'm doing my best to stay alive out there. I wish others would do the same. Damned water sample. I lost my composure a bit, I must admit, Fox, when Cassius decided to do the most tomfool thing I've ever seen with my own eyes. They marched right out onto the water's edge while some 30-meter monstrosity snapped voraciously at a drone overhead. If it had taken its eyes off that drone for even a minute, they would have been a goner. No question. You should have seen the look of triumph on their face, though, Fox. <laughs> Cassius stumped back in that clunky, slow hazmat suit and put the bottle in Elizabeth's hand like a knight bringing the heart of a dragon back to the queen. I have to admit, after it felt like my heart rate was back under control, that was one of the coolest things I had ever seen, too. I hope that wasn't the moth doing things to my head again. Oh, yes! There was the strange airborne creature again, and this time we got a good look at it through the drone camera. It looked like a giant moth, and it took off with the drone, too. Cassius and Elizabeth aren't even sure it is moth-like, but they told me I said something about a moth while I was... entranced, so that's what we're going with for now. The same feeling got Alex, too. We both just kind of babbled for a bit, and then we're feeling ourselves again moments later. Alex agrees with me now, though. It feels like only a fraction of time, and you're not particularly aware of what you might be blathering about while under the effect. Once again, there was no direct contact, and the talk screens from my last encounter revealed nothing untoward. So its mechanism for psychoactivity remains a mystery. I hope I wasn't too open while under its sway. Wouldn't want to make things awkward. Cassius was looking at me with an odd expression the whole way back to the breach, though. Uh, hello? Cassius, is that you again? Knocking at my door at all hours. Nobody here but us cowboys. Wait, why would it be Cassius? Greg, Jay, I... Uh, come in, come in. Cassius just 
Cassius has been over a time or two after our expeditions already. I just thought... Ooh. Oh, is that all? Damn, Greg, if only we'd learned to read and write all fancy, like they told us before we joined the army. We wouldn't be kicking all bachelor style like we are now. I... What are you... I assure you both, I am still very much kicking it bachelor style. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, all right. We didn't come to make pot shots. We came to hang out. We've got some time off. Let's pop a few brewskis and just be glad we're still breathing. You don't got to drink if you don't want it, Silas. Greg's just being friendly in his own Texan way. I brought some goodies from June, too. Damn, that woman can bake like nobody's business. You got to try these little divinity cookies, Silas. The ones with the cherry on top. Mmm, so good. I love when she makes those. They taste just like back home. Almost. She does try her best, doesn't she? This whole isolation and hiking around guy thing would be feeling mighty reminiscent of army life if it weren't for her ministrations. At least with her around, the food is phenomenally better. I might wrestle a bear or two if I knew she was making fried chicken back here at Vincula. <laughs> Hell, I might even take on another Unilove Warren. <laughs> Yeah, look you poking fun at the poor linguist while you got June making eyes at you all day. I know you were eyeing retirement on Vingula wages, Greg, but you look like you're going for the whole settling down package all at once. Mrs. Dawson does speak rather fondly of you when she does speak of you, Greg, which is with notable regularity. Hey, a fella can dream, can he? I thought I'd burned up all my luck when I got this job with Vingula. Well, maybe I did, so no sense in relying on luck. Anything or anybody worth having is worth spending a great deal of time on. So it's slow and steady, boys. I'm content to just be as sweet as pie and see where things may go. And let that be a lesson to both of you youngins. You've got your whole lives ahead of you, so no rushing into things. Yeah, yeah. Sure thing, Pops. I'm certainly not condoning brash actions of any kind, but... Technically, the rest of our lives could be measured in days, depending on how things go in the breach. Uh, now you've done it. Nah, Silas is right. The scene of combat zone, but it's dangerous. You gotta admit, I knew what the money Vincula was offering, it was probably gonna be a bit heated out there, but this safari has been another thing entirely. But I've been shot at before, and I've made my peace with it. And I still think now, as I did then, Never reason to live like today's your last day, because even if it is, you ought to be savoring each moment and living the best you can anyway. That can be laid back. That can be patient. You don't got to be living a fast life to enjoy it. Uh, you got Pops harping full time now, Silas. Good going. Happiness and fulfillment can be like a glass of cold sweet tea on a porch swing on a hot summer day. Or maybe like a brand new book with that new book smell. I don't know, I'm reaching here. I, I was never one for academia, so I don't know what y'all academics like. You don't feel smarter just being near Silas? I swear my IQ's going up a few points from just his music choice. Oh, you finally ready to break into double digits now? Just because you heard some dusty old classical? As a matter of fact, the music choice was another of Mrs. Dawson's suggestions for me on how to unwind. <gasps> Ooh... Just some dusty old classical relaxation, I guess, Greg. <clears throat> Jeremiah, you know you can really gain some IQ points from listening to this. Feels like real music of the soul, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say some shit like that, you old fart. I just really feel at peace right now, you know? <clears throat> Greg, I've been meaning to ask you something. Fire away. I've noticed something of an oddity amongst our little troop. I mean, there's probably at least three or four of them walking around with their notebooks all day long in Gaia. I'm sorry, I'm being dumb again. Go on now, Silas. I'll shut my big mouth till you're finished. Now there's an opportunity you don't get but once in a blue moon. Better go for it while you can, Silas. When I applied for the position here, I remember there was a very strange question that stood out on their application. One of the last ones regarding, uh... Paranormal experiences? The very same. I don't mind volunteering that I said yes to the question myself. Well, a little more ambivalent on it. But enough of a yes that Vincula, or rather Miss Vo in particular, was satisfied. 
I've gone through a metamorphosis on my train of thought about why they needed that information. At first, I thought it would help color the nature of the linguistic work they were hiring me for. Then, when I saw the breach, I thought they were asking because they wanted people to have a healthy skepticism in general, so that they could work with the breach with an open mind. But now that I've had a chance to ask around, it seems like they went out of their way to hire literally everyone I've spoken to with the same question on the line, regardless of whether you're a scientist or a residence manager or what have you. If it's not too much to ask, did they... Hear that, Jeremiah? Dadgummit, it's like I was saying. I told you I was suspicious about it. <sighs> yeah, you were right again. As usual, I guess. I'm not any happier for it, though. Huh. You gotta answer your question, Silas. They asked me much the same. Wanted to know if I at least had an open mind about it, as you said. Had to go a bit in depth about it, too, just to get the job. Or at least that was the strong inclination I got from my interview. That wasn't the only thing that set me off about the whole hiring process, though. I don't know what your experience was like, but they had a bunch of us there trying to get on security detail. Kind of a bulk interview process. I guess they wanted to know if we're physically fit, combat trained, and all that, of course. But there was some interesting hopefuls there, too. I was chatting with the guy next to me, just trying to be friendly as usual. And he had loads of wildlife experience. I was getting intimidated because dealing with wildlife had been one of the criteria, but it wasn't as important as survival skills, or that's what the advertisement I found had said. But this guy was making me sweat. I was starting to think, hell, why am I doing this at all? I haven't got a chance, might as well pack it up. But then he went in and I just kind of figured I'd stick it out at least, since I was next in line. This dude comes back out real quick though. Looking mad as hell, then he tells me outright, might as well not bother, they're wackos. Says this kind of loud to everyone and walks out. Well, then I had my interview, and of course I must have impressed them enough that they put me in charge of security. But I've been thinking. They must have told that guy no on the spot, and given his reaction, it was probably the issue of paranormal belief. Shit, they had already checked my references and determined my skill set was up to par. All they really wanted to know was my experience. As I said, everyone I've spoken to has had a similar experience with Vincula. I thought there was a rationale for it, given how the breach is, you know. But they were ubiquitous in their hiring process about it. Feels extreme, especially for those with no plans to go into the breach at all. Surely that wouldn't require a belief in the paranormal. To do things like analyze samples or tidy around the offices? You'd think so, wouldn't you? I can't fathom a reason for needing that as a prerequisite for hire, other than just to make sure their staff was at least strong skeptics. But what purpose does that serve? Since I'm already being nosy, do you mind if I ask about your own experience? Only if it's something you're willing to share. As you can see here, you... Noticed it on your first day here, when we were suiting up to go inside the breach, and I've kept it up. I'm recording what I can, out of mistrust for Vincula, and a desire to keep a personal log. I'm not sure which of the two of those weigh more, but I think this information will be important later, in helping us deepen our understanding of the breach, and of finding motives for Vincula. I've recorded a few other stories, and again, if you're okay with that, I'd like to get yours. Oh shit, smile for the camera. That's a brave move, considering how high up this whole shindig has gone. We got feds crawling all around that might take an exception to your methods, Silas. I had thought about that, but so far no one unaffiliated with Vincula has bothered approaching me, and I figured I'd volunteer the information that I was keeping a recorder if anyone bothered asking me. I... Might get a proverbial smack on the wrist, but what could they do to a researcher doing research? An awful lot, Silas. A hell of a lot. <sighs> I agree with Jay. Yeah, you might have a plausible case in your defense, but we're dealing with extremely sensitive information. Even if you didn't suffer immediate consequences, you're painting a target on your ass with this. You might not have any dirt on them, but you've been caught with a shovel in your hand. For some agencies, that's all it takes. 
But for now, you don't think anybody's a wiser outside the breachers? I... I don't think so. I showed Cassius, and I don't think they'll let anyone know about it. Highly doubtful. Cassius has no love of either of the two suits that have decided to take up residence here. Federal or corporate. At any rate, I wouldn't go trusting too many others. I understand if the breachers get wind of it. We spend so much time together, it's bound to get spotted or come up in conversation, most likely. Might have to put our heads together and have a chat about it next time we're out and about on Gaia, just so we're all clear, keeping it to ourselves. Still, I think it's a good thing you're doing, and info like this could be real valuable if there's any mishandling going on. I'm not too keen on trusting the suits either. Vincula's been acting like a lot of this has been pre-planned, but it's unclear how. Which brings me to my experience. It's not all that enticing or convincing. I guess you could say, hell, I damn near got diagnosed with PTSD, and the doc was ready to call it a day and move on after that. And I was all set to believe him. Felt better to give it a label as a condition rather than think for it even a second it might have some kind of reality attached to it. I still dread thinking about it. Thinking about how it might be real. How it could be true what happened to my squad mates. Let's take the clock back a few years, yeah? Quite a few years, actually. And not a peep out of you, Jing. I know I'm old now, but I was just a runt back in Desert Shield. Younger than anyone on the Breach team is currently. Fresh out of basic and barely had the sense to know which end was the lead dispensing part of the gun. I spent most of the war being shuffled from place to place, marching in desert heat. Get out of this truck, march some more, get into that truck. Whole lot of hurrying up and waiting around. In other words, the quintessential army experience. We only got hit bad once. But we lost three of our guys that day. Youngins too, just like me. I don't know about you two, but I know I felt invincible, right up until we weren't. Probably just young and dumb, but that day rocked our world. We all keenly felt the absence of our comrades, our friends. It was real quiet in the platoon for a while, and that's when I started seeing them. Maybe the heat had baked my brain a bit, maybe I was coping, conjuring mirages in my brain to keep the despair at bay. I don't know. I don't have a solid answer for it even now. I'm just going to tell you as best I can. I got up one night and left the tent behind. Just had to get out of that enclosed space. I sat down, just kind of let myself wander, enjoying the cold blankness of the desert night. Was kind of hoping some of that frigid emptiness would sink inside of me. Internally, I was still reeling with fear, regret, anger. Had no idea what to latch on to. Just felt like I was treading water while a storm raged in my mind. That's when I heard a still, small voice beside me. I ain't much for one of religion. Never hated it. I just knew what my mama taught me, and that was all. But I figured if God was going to start talking to me, I guess it would go something like a faint whisper I heard. So I just tried to clear my head and really listen, thinking maybe I'd get some divine revelation after all. Would have pleased mama something fierce, you know? But I didn't get the word of the Lord. No. What I got was the worst feeling of loss I'd ever felt. Like everything I'd felt up to then was child's play. This was true anguish. Despair. Cloying and all-encompassing. I felt swallowed up by it. Drowning. Pulled under by the waves and watching the dying light fade away above me. While I was crushed by the weight of hopelessness I felt being poured out over me. I didn't hear the words. The voice spoke and I just got these mental images. Pictures of things playing out like a movie. I saw what must have been fathers, someone's sons, daughters, even some wives and girlfriends. I somehow knew who they were without knowing their names, but they had... It's real hard to describe. I just knew who they were to me, their relationship to me, without knowing who they were at all. A whole bunch of them, each with a feeling attached to them. In one place I'd see a lady, and I'd know we were lovers, but I could feel the bitterness of loss, knowing she'd never see me again. But I was still here, right? 
I was seeing all this and still breathing. Where was that pang of grief coming from? I saw a gruff old geezer and thought of him as a father. I saw he frowned at me and instantly felt shame and wrath like a hot geyser in my chest. I couldn't make no sense of it, but I tell you sure as I stand here. I was shook. I ain't got the words to describe what all I was feeling. I just know there was a lot of regret there. A lot of pain and suffering. It sapped after a while, but by that time the sun was already starting to rise. Felt like I was finally allowed to come up for air and the storm had subsided. I didn't talk about it to my squad mates. Didn't talk to anyone about it at all until I was back home after. I finally went to visit a shrink. I couldn't get the power of those feelings out of my head. They helped me a little, but I was still so overwhelmed. I might have just been content to go get some meds and therapy, but I decided to pursue things. I looked up the details on the fellows who had died and started trying to communicate with their family members. Told them I was in the same platoon and just wanted to talk, if they were willing. I knew them all on sight, Silas. I'd shake their hands, see their eyes, pass the tears, and I knew each and every one. I had never met them before in my life, but I knew who they all were. These children, these spouses, these parents, they were family members of my fallen comrades. But I saw them as I did in that desert nightmare, as if I was seeing them through the eyes of each lost soldier. I barely knew what to say, but I knew the feelings left behind. I couldn't say much but how sorry I was. And sometimes I'd just say something like how much they were valued and adored by the dead, if it felt right. I didn't get an answer or words to say, but it felt like I was doing what was right. And it helped, man, it helped. It was painful, but I felt the immense suffering lessen just a hint with each visit, like I was leaving a little bundle behind every time. God, it ripped my soul apart every time. But I didn't stop. Between deployments and even another war... I kept visiting until I'd visit every single one, or it felt like I had. Some of them just sobbed, some of them were thankful, some didn't want to talk to me outright or cuss me out, but I stuck to it. Like I said, I might have been conjuring the whole thing. Maybe I was just seeing what I wanted to see, lessening my own feeling of guilt and oppression while leaving it all with these family members. I wonder if I did the right thing after all, if I wasn't just helping myself and causing more of a problem for all of them. I don't rightly know, Silas. I can't say I'll ever know. But I just did my best, like I always try to do. I can't vouch for the actual occurrence, but I've known Greg since he was my first sergeant in the Iraq War. I knew he was watching out for us. Every single man in the company. And afterwards... I went with him on a few of the trips he made to the bereaved families. He's playing it down, but he seemed to always know what to say. It's like the ghosts were leaning on his shoulder and whispering what to say to him. Shit, I don't want to think about it like that at all. But as I don't rightly know exactly what's going on with me, I got nothing to say against it. Even amongst the stories I've heard so far, this one is a standout. I've not heard one like this before. My condolences on your losses, Greg. Hmm. Here. Raise your glasses to fallen comrades. To fallen comrades. Here, here. Well, guess it's time for your spooky tale now, Jay. Don't think you're getting away with it that easy. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I figured my time was coming. All right. Well... I don't have Battery a war low. story like Greg. Mine goes to my Battery youth. Low. Florida Everglades. Shutting down. I'm part of Big Family Scene. Vincula is quite pleased with the breacher's progress in charting Gaia's terrain and logging flora and fauna species. We hope you received ample time to rest and recover, as this week promises to be an exciting one. There are several new points to discuss, and we have information coming from every department with progress in their fields. Let's start with our linguist update. Mr. Caldwell, if you please. Certainly. I've had a chance to briefly peruse the document pulled from Specimen 1's limb. 
It is indeed a collection of parchment, dried animal skin with ink lettering. The symbols closely match that of the unknown language isolate contained in the Akkadian dual language book. And furthermore, the parchment bundle has been carbon dated between six and eight thousand years old. I am not an expert in that field, but I have been advised this may be an inaccurate dating, as we are reliant on atmospheric carbon data pulled from an exceedingly short window on Gaia. So further study may be needed, but that is our current estimate. Holy shit, that's ancient. Sorry, quick interjection. Is there any trace evidence left by Specimen 1 on the parchment? While not my specialty, I can report from the lab that there was nothing to indicate the presence of foreign material on the parchment. So, unless the animal skin used to form the parchment was from Specimen 1, no, there was not so much as a hair that didn't match the parchment composition itself. Oh my god! They may have skinned part of Specimen 1 to make the parchment? As disturbing as that sounds, the alternative is that Specimen 1 somehow managed to leave no trace of its existence, despite us pulling that bundle right off of its arm. While I'm still unsure if Specimen 1 had hair, there should have been some, even microscopic, evidence of it left behind differing from the parchment. <sighs> Occam's razor dictates the former assumption to be more likely in this case. It's... Grizzly, but a civilization practicing live burial could also be practicing the use of animals, even live ones, for economic purposes like the crafting of writing materials. I cannot state unequivocally that the parchment is from specimen one's own tissue, but I digress. What I do know is that translation will be significantly harder for this parchment as I now have a much older variation of the language to work with because it appears handwritten without the benefit of a machine press or serialized lettering. There's a great deal of variation, even in characters I think I recognize from the latter half of the Akkadian book. I will report back with any segments I do get translated. Well, at least we can guess that whoever wrote the books had some kind of inkling of how the breach works, or had its hand in its creation, given that the symbols on the link stones and the breach, they all match up with the language on the artifacts recovered so far. I will leave further conjecture for later. For now, we also have an interesting update from Alex regarding the drone she lost. Yeah. Sorry about that. I did my best, promise. <clears throat> anyway, after that huge moth creature flew off with the drone, we obviously couldn't remote control it anymore. It didn't have the necessary power to escape either, so we kind of chalked it up to a lost cause. We do have a passive radio emitter attached to the drone, but we figured like all the other items left behind overnight, it would be rendered inoperable and unable to be detected. Well, we sent a team in during our break, just to the breach entrance with a powerful radio detector, and we're still getting a faint signal from the drone! Wait, really? Yay! The drone didn't get eaten! Yet... What are we getting from that drone? Not much. In fact, no data at all other than direction, really. The passive radio emitter was designed to be as easy on the battery as possible, and just send a ping every now and again that could be picked up with our detectors. We can't get things like camera images or even local temps, but at least the battery will last a while longer. We've got time to try and find the drone, and maybe find habitat of the moth critter. The only thing I can comment on is, based on the weakness of the signal we're getting back, it's a long way off. It might be out of reach for a day's travel, but is it worth a shot at least? I think so. Vincula certainly thinks so. Before the drone signal gives out completely, your next few forays into the breach will be directed at attempting to relocate and recover our lost drone. Even if the drone itself is replaceable, it could provide valuable data for our analysis teams. And helpful for our science teams as well. The psychoactive effects of the moth, while currently anecdotal, are worth inspecting and finding countermeasures for. On that note, do you and Elizabeth have any details to share on the drone's captor, Cassius? So, Elizabeth and I talked for a bit, and we have nothing super solid yet, given how little evidence we have of the creature so far. We saw it, and while far off, it did have the appearance of a large moth, and was able to easily grasp the drone underneath it with its appendages. That'd give it a wingspan of something between 
three to five meters roughly. It had bright green and white coloration, though any patterns were indistinguishable from our viewing point. Closest Earth relative might be a lunar moth. But now there's this question of the psychoactive effects it always seems to bring with it. First affecting Silas when it flew so far above our heads we could barely make it out in the sky, and then again affecting Alex and Silas when it swept the drop. Elizabeth, could you share the theory we have? I don't have a lot of data on a moth that could be causing out-of-body experiences, but it may be that the moth itself isn't toxic. It could be carrying pollen or other materials from a hallucinogenic plant. The hawk moth on Earth is known for pollinating species of plants which contain potent deliriants. It's possible, then, that the moth is gently sprinkling some of these compounds wherever it flies. How it only affects a few of us so far... I don't... I have no additional guesses on that. Maybe Silas is just really unlucky? Can confirm. Finding the drone might give us more clues about the moth. I don't like the idea of our team all tripping out though, so we'll have to be careful in our approach. But finding plant samples near the moth's habitat could give us an idea of what is causing the psychoactive effects. Because of that and the drone recovery mission, on our next trip we're beelining for the drone signal. Excellent. That concludes our meeting today, and I'm sure Cassius will have you embarking shortly. Once again, Vincula wishes you the best of luck and safe travels. Beelining away from the breach and headed straight for a moth that robs you of your senses. Also, it might live in a hallucinogenic jungle. Sure, what could go wrong with that? Silas Caldwell, Specimen Log for Vincula, 6th Expedition on Gaia. On our way to recover the drone lost on the previous expedition, the breachers have discovered a new, seemingly docile species. Cassius has a description. What we're seeing are small bird-like creatures, closely resembling Earth's chickens. In place of feathers, however, they are covered in scales from head to toe, ranging in shades of green and blue to bright reds and oranges. Other than that, they are behaving quite similarly to their Earth counterparts, crowing and all. Beautiful coloration! They even have four-toed feet, short beaks, and... I think you can spot the males by the addition of spiked growths on top of their heads? Yeah, that's probably the most metal-looking mohawk I've ever seen on a chicken. Some of them, again, like Elizabeth said, presumably males due to their larger size and brighter coloration, mimicking those of earth chickens, have a set of spikes growing above their eyes in a single row. Let's count. Five, six, seven spikes on that one. The largest is in the middle, and they get smaller as they curve outward around its skull. It could be for self-defense or sparring with other males. <laughs> you want to take a chance on them, Greg? Nope, I'm fine over here, thanks. Just sweeping the perimeter. I'll let y'all take one for the team if you'd like. Joking aside, I'm not getting near them for now. We can't afford any slowdowns today. Our signal to the drone is barely gaining any strength. Still, I wanted to make a quick note about this creature, and we've got most of the day remaining to us. Anyway, that's all for now. Let's get moving. That's all for now. Let's get moving. Good. I got all that. Uh, Cassius, if I could mention something to you and the Breachers for just a moment. Yeah? What's up? <laughs> what? Was that not fancy enough for Vincula or something? No. No. Nothing like that, sorry. I wanted to mention something unrelated, now that we're a respectable distance from the breach. I've completed my recordings, for the breachers at least, and I confirmed that everyone was asked by Vincula to provide proof of paranormal activity or belief in some capacity. I don't have everyone's specifics, but we can peruse the stories later to see if we find any common threads among them. Hmm. So we're all a bit dysfunctional, huh? Oh, joy. Well, just to be clear, I don't think that even gives me pause anymore. I wanted to play at being skeptical for a bit longer, but the events of the last week or so have broadened my horizons. <sighs> well, so far, this has been a good group to travel with, but it's Vincula that's been playing too shysty for my liking. They've had a definite plan for all of this, and now they want to act like there's nothing strange about their line of questioning. 
I straight up asked Miss Vo about it, and all I got was the canned finding individuals with open minds spiel. So what gives? Well, where does that leave us? It's suspicious, but there's nothing to report anyone for, other than strange business practices. And if we wanted to make a report, we can't exactly fly in the face of the lockdown. And who are we going to talk to anyway? The press? They could easily call us crackpots and dismiss any claims we make outright. That's true. And I don't recommend it myself. I don't think we really can report this any higher. If the feds are in on it, then it's already a matter of national security, and there's nothing much we can do about it. If we go back to the theory that Vincula is mostly just looking to turn a profit, like any company, someone's bound to start asking questions about where all this real estate and these new biological samples are coming from. They can't really expect to turn a profit any other way without eventually going public. Unless the government is just paying them to explore Gaia for its own sake, but that can't stay the case for long, right? Someone's gonna start getting greedy. I... I guess I still don't understand what there is to be upset about yet. It's weird, but like Jay said, there's nothing that's been done yet and nothing much for us to do about it anyway. You're rarely, if ever, going to hear me say something like this again, but I think our best option is patience. I've scrapped with a government official or two before, and you never make headway getting up with you with them. Instead, our best bet is to document everything thoroughly and protect what evidence is being made. When Vincula decides to make their move and play their hand, we just gotta be sure some word of it gets out somewhere down the line. I have to believe that there are people that would want to see these natural resources protected. We're screwing up one planet, there's no need whatsoever for another to suffer under our stewardship. While we might be able to scientifically observe Gaia, I flat out don't trust Vincula to be the ones in charge of it. But, like it's been mentioned before, there's not a lot we can do now. So let's watch and wait and keep our eyes and ears open and just do our best to look out for each other. It might be a bit foolish, but I want to trust you guys here. We've known each other for a short time, but we're all we've got. So let's watch each other's backs, all right? I'm in. Mostly because it's less work for me if nobody is making trouble in the first place. They'd expect me to scrape up whatever was left after anyone's unfortunate workplace accident. And I'm not about that life. That sounds easy enough. Just watching out for each other. We're basically doing that now, aren't we? It's what I signed up for, so it's what I'll be doing. Hell, this will make for some fine stories when and if it does make headline news. Fred, L, I ain't dragging y'all into this. All I'm asking is you keep doing what you're doing. I'm just here for a paycheck, man. If I just keep doing what I'm doing, it's all right with me. I think you know what you're doing, Greg. I trust you. Ooh, it's time to do a little corporate espionage. I'm probably no good at keeping secrets, but I can always keep busy with the scientific side of things. I wouldn't want anyone getting hurt, either. So count me in. I suppose I'm in, too. If only because I don't trust myself to win a five-on-one fight. The pen is mightier than the sword, but any one of you is stronger than the linguist. All right, negative Nancy. You say that like you weren't the one to start recording right under the man's nose in the first place. Shit, you got us into this mess, and now you gotta keep up with those recordings. If anyone needs to save face, those will be invaluable in getting the truth out there. Right. Well, and here I was worried you were going to recommend outright sedition. Instead, I think you're doing the right thing. Did that close call with Titan please you sort make you start thinking before dashing in? This is peaceful sedition. I wouldn't put it past them to try and silence us. But what can they do if we're compliant in the meantime? I'm only on this expedition until they start bulldozing breechwood trees to make room for condos. Then they might have to send me to sleep with the Astid Nessie. If they can catch me before I can rope up a few thousand people to storm the facility. At least, that's my working plan. Hopefully it won't come to that. <laughs> Alright, we've wasted enough time. It's breachers for life now, but we still gotta find that drone. Let's get moving. Silas Caldwell, 6th Expedition, Specimen Log for Vincula. We found another clearing in the breach woods, and there's 
another fallen breechwood tree. This one landed in a dip in the terrain and partly sits in a small pond of water. We haven't seen rainfall since our first incursions into the breach, but it may rain overnight or there may be extended periods without rain, but the shade provided by the fallen tree may protect it from evaporating in the sun too quickly. Honestly, I wouldn't mind some rain now. <sighs> it's so hot marching all day, even in the shade. Sorry, let me just make a few more notes here. Oh, uh, sure. Here you go. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so... There is what appears to be fungal growths that have overtaken the fallen trees almost entirely. Obviously, I'll have to get samples back to the analysis team to be sure about the fungal nature of the specimen, but the trees appear to have been dead for some time. And this particular shroom is thriving in the shade that has since been created by the canopy overhead, not to mention the damp conditions surrounding the tree. This whole scene of decay is perfect for fungus. The specimen is a bit strange looking. It's bright orange, like really bad iron rust orange, and what I assume to be the fruiting bodies of fungus are formed in large, brain-like pods filled with nooks and crannies on its surface. Each pod is a little bigger than a bowling ball, around half a meter in diameter, with some variants. The grooves along the surface are quite dark, almost blackened, and I can see structures that look like gills within. That's probably where the mushroom spores are growing, and- Lizzie? Uh, yes, Cassius? I think it's looking at me. Come here, don't get too close. I don't want you inhaling any spores, but take a close look at the gills again. Okay. I'm looking? What do you mean it's looking at you? Like there's something living in there, or- <gasps> It's- the grooves, they're, they're lined with little structures that look, they look like stenciled eyes. <gasps> oh, wow! You know, I thought I was dreaming it up, but every time the sun peeks through the tree canopy, the eyes open and reveal themselves. There's a little flap that makes them almost invisible until they open up. I wonder if the flap is meant to protect the gills from sunlight? That's really creepy looking. There's, there's dozens of them, all opening and closing in sync with the movement of the sunlight across the pods. Might be a decent way of warding off creatures that want to graze in the pods, too. The suddenness of the movement is striking enough to act as a warning sign, and the eyes are a ghostly blue color under the lids. Blue is one of the colors that means danger in the natural world. Although I don't know if that holds true for Gaia. It's working on me. I've had quite enough of things that want to mess with my brain for a week, let alone a lifetime. Last thing I'd like to interact with is a potentially highly toxic mushroom. Alright, that's enough notes for now. We gotta get moving again. The drone signal is finally gaining strength, but we're approaching the halfway mark where we gotta turn back for the day. If we don't find it on this trip, we can try and go faster on the next round, but let's get as far as we can. Here, Alex, give me that mask and specimen bag. I'll grab one of these smaller pods for analysis, and we'll be on our way. Oh, how, how do you turn this off? This button here? Silas Caldwell, 6th Expedition into Gaia, Biome Log for Vincula. We're a short distance, uh, only half an hour's walk or so, from the fallen breechwood and the fungus growing on it. And we're starting to encounter a new biome. The breech woods are giving way to a smaller set of trees, more akin to weeping willows in size and shape, which now dot the landscape. Also, now that the breechwood canopy is no longer covering the horizon in all directions, the newly opened skyline has offered us a glimpse of what's ahead of us. I can see the tops of mountains on the horizon, and the terrain is gradually filling with hills. There's a large number of ridges and dips between us and the peaks, our drone signal is pointing us at the mountains, though it may be somewhere between here and there. We are ill-equipped for mountain hiking, and Cassius says we only have a few short hours left before we've made it to the halfway point of our allotted time in the breach. Not gonna lie, the breach woods are really exciting and all, but a change of scenery is most welcome. These new trees have long, drooping branches forming domes very similar to earthly weeping willow trees, the leaves are bright, citrus colors though, not green. 
<laughs> I, I can't see green anywhere. I'm not sure if this is an indication that they're in a fall stage or that they're naturally colored with wild hues of yellow, orange, and red. Every time the wind blows, the trees rustle and a bunch of what look like seed pods take flight on the breeze. It's gorgeous to look at, and I can just barely tell the wind is a few degrees cooler since it's coming from the mountain range. God, that is a welcome feeling. I could very happily sit right here all day. Not having another one of them trances, are you, Alex? Nope. That's just exactly what I could do right now. This stunning view with the mountains way off in the distance, a field of trees that look like technicolor bubbles, and finally some clear sky. And that gust is a breath of fresh air. You guys head on back. I'll just be putting a cabin right about here. Oh, right. The nocturnal creatures still want to eat us all. <laughs> Drad. And Lingus Mode activated just in time before anybody got hurt. Your infectious morbidity saved the day again, Silas. I didn't even say anything that time. I mean, I was just about to, but still. Ooh, ooh, one of them's drifting this way. Come on, just a little closer. Come on, drift down already. Yes, yes, that's right, just a little closer. How many times am I going to ask myself if my teammates are suffering from delusions or just trying to catch a specimen? I'm going to bet at least a hundred times, minimum. Hey, you're on. First round of drinks after lockdown is on you if it's less. That seed pod's blowing closer. Get ready, Lizzie. A little closer, that's right. Come on. There! <laughs> right in the palm of my hand. Oh, it's it's beautiful. There's an itty-bitty seed pod attached to what looks like a dandelion puffball. That must be how it floats on the wind. The fuck? Elizabeth? What the hell? Hey, Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Elizabeth. Stay back. All of you. What happened? I... I don't know. I don't know. I, I heard a sound, and I think the seed pod exploded, and she just collapsed. Okay, she's still breathing and has a pulse, but she's out cold, man. Did it blow up in her face? I think so, but there's no trauma to her face. She must have inhaled something. Here, I'm going to drag her clear of the seed, and then we got to get her back to the breach. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Okay, Alex. I've got a job for you. Keep talking to her, okay? If she comes to, let us know immediately. I have to get this stretcher assembled. Greg, give me a hand. On it. Elizabeth? Elizabeth, can you hear me? She, she's not, she's not saying anything. That's okay. It's okay. Just keep talking to her. You're helping her. I promise. Come on, Lizzie. Say something to us. You can't clock out yet. We're barely getting started out here. Do you, do you guys need help? We're going to have to take turns carrying the stretcher so we can go as fast as possible. I don't know if we've got a clock ticking or if she's just knocked out for a while, but no sense taking chances. I'll keep an eye on her vitals, but if we don't stop and we do a brisk jog all the way, we can make it back in just a few hours. I just hope she keeps stable. Someone get a mask on and bag that seed pod. They might need it for analysis of her condition back at Vincula. All right, I got the first haul. Fred, get over here and grab the other end. Cassius, hope you were taking notes. You gotta get us the hell out of Dodge and fast. Right. Follow me. Back to the breach. I got it. Let's go. Syntax is a podcast by Twin Strangers Productions and is licensed under an attribution share like 4.0 international license. Today's episode was directed and produced by Stella Odom and written by Ty Vaughn. Silas Caldwell is played by Ty Vaughn. Cassius Thatcher is played by Beth Fung. Elizabeth Bellinger is played by Morgie B. Alex Yard is played by Jules Christine. Miss Evelyn Vaux is played by Kyla Crockett. Greg Washburn is played by Cody Burke. Jeremiah Woods is played by Eldrin Smith. Additional voices and sounds provided by Gage Odom, Katrina Rogers. Listen to other episodes, find our social media links, and make donations by visiting syntaxpodcast.com. 
rate us on iTunes and Google Podcast, and follow us on Spotify. Tweet us at TwinStrangersP with your burning questions and engage with fellow listeners on our subreddit, r slash syntaxpod. Thanks for listening.